This is Texas Public Radio's Great Essay. I'm David Martin Davies. Great Essay is a series of conversations about San Antonio's history and culture that makes South Texas great. Great Essay is made possible due to support from Culligan Water of San Antonio and Frost. Today we're discussing an organization that has been at the vanguard of preserving San Antonio's history, heritage, and structures for nearly a century, the San Antonio Conservation Society. What have been the Conservation Society's great successes and losses. What's next for historic preservation in San Antonio, particularly as we're working to create a more inclusive society. Now this is a community interactive conversation and we encourage your participation online. Now you can comment and write your questions on Facebook or YouTube, we'll get those comments on and they'll get them to me. So here's tonight's panel. Now we're joined by Kathy Rhodes, the president of the San Antonio Conservation Society. Kathy, it's great to have you. We're joined by Vincent L. Michael. He is the executive director of the San Antonio Conservation Society. Shanna Shea Miller is the city of San Antonio's historic preservation officer. And Louis F. Fisher, he is a San Antonio author, historian, publisher. Among the books he's written it includes uh, Saving San Antonio, Preservation of a Heritage, uh, The American Venice, an epic story of San Antonio's river, Chili Queens, Hay Wagons and Fandangos, the Spanish plazas, in Frontier San Antonio. Lewis, it's good to have you. Thank you. Good to be here. So uh, we're going to be talking about Conservation Society. And I, I see, you know, full disclosure, you know, I kind of grew up in this, you know, at the, my mom was in the Conservation Society. She was a president of Conservation Society for a time. I, I would go and set up the booths at, at NIOSA and shut corn and do all those things to make NIOSA go. Uh, but it's been amazing to me how it has been a force in San Antonio all of these years uh, using community activism, communications, persuasion, working behind the scenes uh, to do what? Uh, so, <laughs> Kathy Rhodes, tell me about what is the philosophy behind the Conservation Society? Well, of course, it's to preserve our heritage and our culture. Um, I come from a city, Houston, which did totally the opposite. So we're here not only to do that, we have NEOSA, we're famous for NEOSA, but we also do things like heritage education tours, building grants, um, all sorts of things to save. I mean, just look at downtown San Antonio compared with other cities. We have truly saved our important buildings. And along with that, we've attracted a, a visitor market as well. So um, we continue, somebody said to us not too long ago that what do, you, what, have you, what do you do now after you've saved all the important buildings? Well, guess what? New things pop up almost every week. So we're constantly involved, constantly active, of all volunteer uh, member group, and um, we're, we look forward to working on new things like Southwest Craft and some of those things that have just popped up out of the blue. So. Right, and so um, Vince, Michael, as the executive director, so you, you kind of San Antonio, you've been doing historic preservation in other parts of the country, yeah. and you, you heard that they need an executive director at the Conservation Society. Is that like, this is one of the oldest conservation preservation organizations in the country. What, what was the track record that you wanted to be part of? Well, it's partly that it is one of the oldest and has been working to save the architecture, nature, and culture of San Antonio for almost 100 years. Also, credit to Shannon, she brought me here in 2014 to do a talk, and I said this is fabulous. But even if you look nationally, the National Trust, you ask them where are the cutting edges of historic preservation, they'll tell you San Antonio and San Francisco. And, and so Shannon, with the city of San Antonio, historic preservation officer, what is, how do you see, some people would see the Conservation Society as a sort of adversarial role with the city. The city has ideas. They want to knock down buildings and put up uh, new things. Um, maybe not always to see eye to eye with the Conservation Society. How do you work with an organization that you may not always uh, be in alignment with? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I, I think that happens very infrequently when it comes down to it. I mean, we, we, are, we are together on 99% of things because, um, you know, I think uh, Kathy talked about like being able to look around downtown and other places and seeing the success over the years of saving the buildings. And it certainly comes from the advocacy 
but it also comes from having a strong preservation ordinance, and that's administered by the city. And so ultimately, we have to be strong partners, um, both with the, the Conservation Society and the city, but then also with, with the people who are doing the development. You know, like, it, it, preservation is a form of development, and so it's so much about kind of brokering the right deals and, um, and, and really working to find compromise where it's, uh, where it's possible. But I think to your point in your question, one of the reasons why the Conservation Society has been so successful is that they are willing, when necessary, to stand up against the elected officials and, and file a lawsuit or do something like that that the city may not always appreciate at the time, but what they feel is in the best interest of the community. Louis Fisher, as a historian, documenting San Antonio's history you know, I think of it, so for serving buildings, you know, buildings are great, you know, but I wonder, is, is that really the purpose? Is that, you know, sta saving the buildings? Or are we saving the stories? Or what we well, want to know where we came from? Saving the stories. You're saving the uh, uniqueness of the city. You're uh, saving what makes uh, San Antonio distinct from uh, other cities in the country that have uh, torn everything down and that look like uh, every place else. Uh, uh, you say San Antonio and uh, meet somebody from out of town and right away what comes up are, are two of the, the great areas the Conservation Society has worked on. One, of course, the, the Alamo and then the Riverwalk and then things sort of uh, cascade from there. And the missions. Let's and talk about missions. that really quick. Yeah. So uh, Kathy Rhodes Conservation Society, had there no, not been a Conservation Society, I wonder if the missions, how that would be, we wouldn't have that World uh, Heritage Site. No, we wouldn't. And it started with buying the granary at, at San Jose and working up from there. And then actually one of our former presidents, Virginia Nicholas, had the idea to start the World Heritage process. But also forming partnerships, alliances, Always. working with the Catholic Church uh, to do the preservation, helping broker a deal so that there could be uh, where the missions are, which yes. are working parishes and making those uh, state parks and then national parks i mean it was a process it was a long process and los compadres was formed to help help with that pro process it's mission heritage partners now but at the time it was los compadres and susan chando and a few other people paul Rangenbach, wrote the actual grant that went to to get that status and we're the only one in texas so and what's really scary about the missions is that the Conservation Society was formed in the 1920s and very quickly began working on the uh, saving the missions at the very time that development was creeping out. And if the Conservation Society had been organized 10 or 15 years later, it's uh, quite probable that all of the, uh, or cer certainly San Jose and uh, even Concepcion would have been overrun by development. And, and Vincent, um, I'm thinking about the Woolworths building, which yep. is downtown across from Alamo, on Alamo Plaza, and we're seeing the state of Texas, they want to do something magnificent with, uh, in front of the Alamo, and there was a, a, I guess, a point of conflict there about what to do with the Woolworths building, and I think that gets to the heart of really what I want to talk about tonight, which is about whose history gets preserved. And so there may be people who want to argue that, you know, people want to see the Alamo because that's where the battle was. But there were more than one battle was fought there, and there was one for civil rights as well. Can you talk about why we should be paying attention to the Woolworths building and, and what happened? Well, I, I mean, it's six years now since the state purchased the Crockett, Palace, and Woolworth buildings. And we immediately started. We got it listed on the Texas Most Endangered list, the Woolworth, right away because we knew about the important civil rights history, the first voluntary and peaceful desegregation of lunch counters in the South during the 1960 sit-in movement. And um, it was important to us in 2018, after it seemed like the state was gonna go ahead and demolish the Woolworth for a new museum, our, our position had always been, we want the museum, do it in the building. And we finally got there after six years. And so we we really said, let's let's, create as broad base a coalition as we can, Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, the San Antonio Branch NAACP, uh, SAGE on the east side, um, San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum, West Side Preservation, and eventually the uh, Mexican Civil Rights Institute, um, Mexican American Civil Rights Institute. So 
that coalition really made a difference because, you know, when you're dealing with public entities, uh, you need to show that the community is really united behind an idea. And the idea was not the opposite of what they wanted to do. It was just another way of doing it. But sometimes ears aren't always open <laughs> to these other approaches. So, Shannon Miller, um, at this City Hall, how was this discussion being ferried? Well, I mean, you know, obviously a, a lot of the, the conversations that happened um, related to the buildings and the plan for the museum were happening at the state level and the um, that Alamo committee, you know, the, the committee level. Um, but I think, you know, a, a lot of people at City Hall understood and still understand that, um, that it is, you know, part of the desire within Alamo Plaza is to tell that whole story. And part of that story is that the, the mission happened and a city actually grew up around it. And those later buildings are part of that story that, you know, the mission kind of did what it was set out to do in a way. And, um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's important to kind of show that, those layers of history. Right, and, and Lewis Fisher, um, been writing history for a while and, and I've been reporting on stuff for a while, and the stuff I covered has become history. And you can just imagine how it's hard to communicate to some people that there were conflicts over lunch counters. And that was a fracture point in our society. Does it help to have the space preserved to say this is where this happened, and we're gonna tell this story now, we're not just gonna sweep it aside because Phil Collins has got a collection of interesting things that we believe may have been part of the Alamo. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it's uh, it's very important to have uh, the the original site uh, in preserved and in place, and even bearing some resemblance to what it uh, looked like then. Uh, because once you once you have a, a series of these landmarks, not ne necessarily the the Woolworth Building on Alamo Plaza, but some of those. Uh, uh, buildings down uh, along Houston Street uh, that are very historic too. It gives you a sense, uh, it, it documents the passage of time and it gives you a sense of just the sweep of, uh, of history and events that have taken place where you are and it helps put just a whole lot of things in perspective. Right now in our society I believe we're having a crisis of trust with institutions. Uh, there's a crisis of trust with government, with the media, you know, that's why we're seeing, you know, people who won't take a safe and effective vaccine and, and we're having all sorts of fraying. But it seems to be a lot of trust with the conservation society, even today. Uh, how has that developed and developed and maintained, Kathy? I think it's the hard work of the volunteers and the advocacy that we've taken over the years. Um, you don't find, you don't find many groups that have that much of a volunteer effort. And to put together the coalitions, the neighborhood associations, we work with them, they're very important in saving some of our housing structures that we have. It's, it's, it's just an atmosphere of hard work and dedication and advocacy. But a lot of people think of the Conservation Society as an old stodgy organization, maybe occupied with a lot of uh, Anglo women who may not be thinking about what it was like to grow up on the west side. How are you able to explain to them that this is important to you? The, the same way that we did with the Woolworths building, we certainly have members, we even have male members. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we, ha we have almost every ethnic group represented and that's part of the coalition and part of the involvement of the community. I, I've really not seen it too much across the country that that something that strong with that volunteers that lasted that long and saved so much. And, and Vincent, uh, the Conservation Society, well, a lot of people talk about all the history, but isn't part of the mindset is thinking 50 years, 100 years into the future, can you say, we wanna save, okay, there was like this little tap dance studio that was across the street from Woodlawn Lake, mm -hmm. and that got knocked down. And you're saying, people are saying, well, that's nothing special. You know, and, um, but you say, well, look, think about it 50 years from now, that's going to be a unique structure and, you know, and that's a loss that, that, didn't, yeah. that, that didn't get preserved. Sorry, City of San Antonio. 
So how does this conservation society, explain to me the process of thinking 50, 100 years into the future? Well, I think, uh, and that's a good question because preservation is a future-oriented decision. And I think it's part of like what elements of the past does the community want in its future to remind them of the stories, to give them a sense of the space. I think the amazing thing about preserving physical things, and this includes nature like Breckenridge Park, which we helped create the conservancy for a dozen years ago, um, you, you don't get the same thing out of a book, you don't get the same thing out of a plaque. Um, you know, you have to see the thing. So we've just had this debate right across this, uh, the creek about the St. James AME Church Foundation. Right, the San Pedro Creek. And they found these 1875, one of the first African-American uh, uh, religious congregations after, uh, Recon after, after emancipation. Uh, emancipation. And there's been a very uh, dedicated dialogue on how do you save the physical thing so people can see the physical thing. It was very important for everyone that it not be a plaque like the Rincon School over near the Southwest School of Art, that there be something that people can associate with. So I think that's the 50-year perspective. You want to say that there's a physical thing that will automatically remind you of an important story. And in this day and age where misinformation reigns supreme, if you can take some, someone to a location and show them these are the foundations, this was a a church structure that was built by emancipated people who had been enslaved and they were taking agency over their lives. They formed a community. This was important to them and so it's important to us. Yeah, and, and so it, people were very focused um, and a lot of our same partners, the African American Community Archive and Museum, were involved saying, you know, we want to be able to walk the space. We want to get a sense of the size of it, uh, to be able to see the cornerstone which has inscriptions on it. So those things are important. And, and Shannon Miller, uh, with the city of San Antonio, City Hall, we see all these changes going on around here downtown all the time. I mean, things are, it used to be maybe historic preservation in San Antonio wasn't as hard as, as Houston because uh, the economic pace was a lot slower, yes. but the, pe the economic pace has picked up quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot more challenges to saying, okay, we're going to preserve this, especially when someone wants to build a dynamic university right where that thing is so how you do that yeah i mean it's a great point it is there is a lot of pressure and you know i think at, at the end of the day what what we're trying to to do is to preserve not just um the you know like our our historic like built heritage but it's kind of it's a cultural sustainability and environmental sustainability at the same time and so it's it's May, it's telling the stories. It's perpetuating traditions. You know, we've we've focused a lot the last few years um, on like uh, the like living heritage, so um, traditional craft or um, ways of cooking or you know different things like that that are, are important to the community. And I think um, another big priority is trades education. I'm, one of the the challenges that people have on a day-to-day -day basis maintaining their historic properties is a lot of times just not being able to hire somebody that they can afford to work on it. And so the more that we can provide those resources, it makes saving those buildings more viable um, in the face of development pressure. Let me reintroduce for people who may have uh, tuned in late. Uh, this is Great SA with Texas Public Radio, and we're having a conversation about historic preservation in San Antonio with the Conservation Society. We're looking at some of their great hits and some of their misses and what can be learned from that and how should we adapt historic preservation towards more inclusive society. If you want to comment or ask a question, if you're on Facebook or on YouTube, we welcome that. Uh, go ahead and comment in the, that section and we'll get those uh, questions on, on the air. So, um, so you mentioned, Kathy, earlier about UTSA and the Southwest Crest Ursuline uh, facility there. Um, yes. So what is the history behind the Conservation Society and that Ursuline campus? Well, we purchased it originally from the Ursuline nuns and to save the buildings. And this is like, like 60s. 60s. Okay, it was when it was run down, rat infested. Yes. Yeah, I remember. Yes. And we sold it for, I believe, $1 to get the Southwest Craft School going. So um, it not only preserved it, but it started a whole new institution, which is now merged with UTSA, and 
It's a beautiful um, facility. It's beautiful. Part I of mean, the San Antonio Book Festival. Yes, a lot of marriages there. A lot of a couple of funerals I remember over the years. <laughs> uh, um, it's just a place for everybody, and of course there's Club Giro there, and um, it's a nice campus. Right. But the it, book festival, yes. And so, what are your what is your concern moving forward? To preserve those buildings. Right. So I mean, there's there's we haven't heard anything from UTSA. They have these big ambitions for downtown San Antonio, and that's great. That's bringing jobs, and it's going to help yes. San Antonio's economy in many ways. But then also, we have to make sure that at what cost, right? Right. And they, they've pledged us to keep the buildings historic, so that's good. We just haven't heard any details yet because we haven't had a chance to talk to them. But we have every belief that they will do that. And Louis Fisher, what, what more can you tell us more about the Ursuline? I mean, the, who, who we, Ursuline, we say that word like everyone knows what we're talking about. Well, it, uh, it was really the, the Ursuline nuns came to San Antonio in 1851 and uh, uh, to, to minister, I think, their medical, Santa Rosa Hospital, I think, was founded by the Ursuline nuns, and they established a school for girls. In, the, in 1851, I think, it was a t time when there were very few schools for, uh, for boys, even, and they uh, established an academy that uh, became a, a rather large uh, school. I think it was uh, kindergarten through, uh, through high school. But when uh, there was a gap between when the Ursulines moved out to Vance Jackson Road and reopened the school out there where it lasted for a few years and the time when the Conservation Society came in, a developer uh, bought it. And the Conservation Society uh, bought it back piecemeal and there's some very dramatic stories about how I think this, uh, this one building that we saw a picture of here earlier uh, was purchased by the Conservation Society. And I think it, it was something that bought two-thirds of the building or something, and the rest of it was, had to be purchased later. And so it was pieced together in a very uh, difficult uh, fashion. Uh, one of the, uh, the latest buildings, uh, a three-story, uh, I believe it could have been the high school building, was destroyed in a fire. Uh, that if there was anything good about it, it's that that provided sufficient parking for uh, an institution to uh, move into and, uh, and take over the, uh, uh, the school. So it was done uh, not only piecemeal, but in a very orderly fashion using the, the finest methods of uh, historic preservation uh, to preserve a, uh, a very uh, unusual uh, complex in, uh, in Texas. It's right on the river walk, right mm -hmm. downtown. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to imagine that anyone would turn their nose up at that facility, you know, but it's, it's only through the perspective of time and history and all the efforts that mm -hmm. have been made to do that. And you have to wonder, like, what else are we, are we missing? I have a question from one of our viewers, uh, Janie. How does the Conservation Society and the city decide something is worth saving or not worth saving? And let me go to Kathy Rhodes for that first. Well, we, of course, look at the history of it, and we have a great library at our office that people can come and research different things, and we look up all the history, and we certainly talk with OHP because it's probably going to go through a council at some point. So um, it's, it's what, how deep does that history go and how important it is for this community to save it? And whose history? Everybody's history. So when people think about downtown a lot. And is the Conservation Society saying it's not just downtown? I know that there's been some things in rural areas that you decided this is a, a, a building that's important to. There's, there's a whole committee called Farm and Ranch Committee, and they go find farmhouses. We had a couple of dairy barns on the north side, um, old farmhouses that developers, as the city expand, come in and want to raise, raise all that. So we watch that very closely, too. And Shannon Shea Miller, the preservation officer, and mm -hmm. there's a Office of Historic Preservation, and y'all have a process. Describe that process. Sure. Well, in order in order for there to be protection for pro for a property, it has to be designated uh, historic, which is a form of it's an overlay in the zoning, so it's actually tied to the property zoning. And so, in order for that to happen, it ultimately has to be approved by city council. And we have in the Unified Development Code 16 criteria, and in order for a property to be eligible to be a landmark, it has to meet at least three of those criteria. 
So it's not a super high threshold, and fortunately, we have um, very a very good set of of those 16. Several of them touch on. It's not just architecture. A lot of those things touched on touch on cultural history and cultural significance, and so. Um, it definitely leaves the, the window open pretty pretty wide for the type of properties that can be designated. But of course, it is, uh, it is also a political process. And you know, sometimes um, there, are conf there are certainly um, conflicting priorities and sometimes designations get approved and sometimes they don't. Um, there have been, uh, unfortunately, some changes to the state law recently that have made um, designation a little bit more difficult, um, a little higher threshold um, for designation, particularly over an owner's objection or if it's owned by a religious property. And so um, it's, it's made designation a little bit more difficult, um, but it's still uh, you know, a process that has seen a lot of success. I mean, just last month, I think we had five new landmarks that were approved by city council. So. But um, the, the designation process and what y'all look at to decide if something is historic and value and worth preserving, I mean, it does seem like uh, was 503 Urban Loop, the uh, Fanny Porter, mm -hmm. Butch Cassidy house, uh, it, that seems like they would meet that criteria. It does. I mean, we, we think that it does. But uh, the issue that, that came up with that is that it, it was believed to have been designated um, when an a, a number, hundreds of properties were designated in the 80s. And um, after doing some research, there was no evidence that it was included in the ordinance. So it actually, there was nothing to back up the fact that it had been designated. And legally and ethically, we had to, to be upfront about that and say, you know, it's not currently designated, designated, but our research still stands and we still believe that it meets the criteria. And, um, and so, Eventually, the Conservation Society and um, Esperanza, Esperanza Westside and Tier One, and Tier One um, submitted a request for review of historic significance, which is another opportunity. Like basically, uh, a third party individual or organization or group of organizations can submit an application asking the HDRC to initiate a designation process. Um, city Council can initiate, staff can initiate, or of course, the owner of the property itself could initiate. So um, I'm going to follow up a little bit more, but first I'm going to go to Lewis Fisher and see if he can kind of fill in the blanks on 503 Urban Loop, Fanny Porter House, Butch Cassidy. What actually was this like? Uh, like the Wild West? It was totally the Wild West. Uh, that whole neighborhood uh, was filled with uh, densely uh, packed and densely populated houses of ill repute, which uh, gave San Antonio a certain cachet on the, with among the cowboys on the frontier of the 1870s and 80s. But uh, that house uh, itself was uh, occupied by Madame Fanny Porter, who was one of the most uh, uh, illustrious uh, of the ladies uh, uh, in San Antonio at the time. She and was she British, had, cold champagne, clean sheets. Yeah, probably something <laughs> like that. But uh, she, uh, she attracted some of, the, some of the finer gentlemen like uh, Butch Cassidy and his uh, Wild Bunch gang uh, as, uh, in fact, uh, there was a movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in which there's a scene of, I think it was uh, the Sundance Kid doing wheelies on his bicycle in front of a house, which is in front of Fanny Porter's house. Uh, the, the Pinkerton Agency uh, finally. Uh, that's the got famous the sun, uh, raindrops are falling on my head. Yeah, uh, that's it. Scene. That's it. Yeah, I'll let you sing that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, it, um, uh, the Pinkertons finally uh, broke up the gang and they split. And all well, apparently that's where they had their going away party was yeah. at that house before yeah. they left for South America. Yeah, that's right. So that sounds like it's worth saving, Vincent. Yeah, and and I think that's actually a good example because what I keep saying, what I said to uh, uh, the councilman for that district is this is another example like the Woolworth. We're not saying you can't do what you want to do, which was build, I think, a seven or eight story residential high rise because it's a big site. You can save that house, part of the structure that it later became an orphanage and daycare center for over 100 years run by the Catholic Church. You can build your high rise there and keep the building. It's not either or, it's both and. But right now, the what is the designation of that property? We know that it has been purchased by someone who wants to develop it for housing. Um, 
could they like could we wake up tomorrow and it be gone no of course not i mean it, it has to go through so every demolition in the city goes through um review by the office of historic preservation and if there's if it's already designated or if we believe there to be potential significance then we pull the demolition permit and hold it like it's not issued and um, once there's a designation request in process, then there are effectively interim, there's interim controls in place. And so if they were going to do anything to the building right now, it would require HDRC review. And um, in addition to the, even though it's not currently a landmark, uh, it is in the, the downtown. I mean, it still is under the purview of the HDRC because it's in the downtown area. And so um, what's, What's pending review at HDRC currently is the request for review of historic significance, which is what would initiate the um, the, the rezoning or designation process. Um, at some point, we do anticipate that they will come back with a with an application for whatever development they plan to propose. But I think they're 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 waiting at this point to see what happens with the designation. And I think Vince's point is is very important, not only at this property but. Um, any other property that we talk about is it's it's really never black and white or all or nothing i mean it's really about how can we take what's special about this and incorporate it into um the future of the site and there are there are later additions to those buildings for example later alterations that may or may not have the same level of significance and so you know, potentially portions could be saved and other portions could go, but that's the beauty of the HDRC review process because it allows for public input, it allows for um, those council appointed volunteers who serve on the Historic and Design Review Commission to really think through those um, those options and, and weigh the different uh, possibilities. You make it sound like it's ludicrous to think that someone in the middle of the night would bulldoze a historic site, but we've seen that happen in San Antonio. Right? Louis Fisher was like a, a Fink cigar company. That's there right. was the Mother That's House right. at should. Incarnate Word University. Uh, more the, I think the classic one is the Fink Cigar Company, where you it was done, I think, on a Sunday morning, and the rationale is you can't argue with the pile of rubble. So and so that's the nightmare that you guys mm -hmm. have at the Conservation Society. It that is. I don't think happens quite as often as it used to. No. I think the penalties, I believe, are a lot uh, higher uh, if something like that should be attempted. What was significant about the Fink Cigar Company? Well, I think our, the, bu the building had some architectural significance. Uh, I think the Fink Cigar Company was one of the oldest uh, tobacco companies in, in Texas. Remember there was uh, a strike prominent, against there? I think Tim and family, Tim, yeah, Emma Tenayuka led a strike mm -hmm. against yeah. them before the pecan shiller. Right, right. So, yeah, it had significance mm -hmm. in San Antonio. Here's another uh, question from a viewer. With so many transplants in SA, uh, most fall in love with what's preserved, but many don't care how society and the Office of Historic Preservation reach out to a broader audience about the importance of preservation. So how do you uh, reach out to a broader audience about historic preservation, Kathy Rose? You mark it well, and you let all these new people know about what you're doing and why they need to participate. Um, talking like Alamo Ranch, which is a huge new area in the city, and somebody said in five years it's gonna be as big as Corpus Christi. Well, that's a whole new audience that we have to educate and um, sell them the doctrine, so to speak. Well, one of the things we try to do is have our membership meetings and public presentations in different parts of the city to try to get the word out. I think it's also important to, to try to reach people where they are, so to speak, like think of different ways to engage. I mean, for example, um, later this week, as part of the World Heritage Festival, we're hosting Restored by Light, which is an event at a Mission San Jose this year that shows um, what the facades of the mission would have looked like historically using projection technology. And what's great is in, in years past, you know, literally thousands of people have come out with their kids and they're running around and they're playing and they're just enjoying family time, but at the same time, they're learning about the rich history of San Antonio. Um, we, we do a lot of like hands-on um, classes and fairs and silly events like um, the amazing preservation, pre preservation race for kids where hopefully the kids come, they learn something about historic preservation and they teach their parents. And so, you know, there's, we really try, I think both organizations try to be really creative about programming 
so that we can attract different types of people in different communities. And one of the things that I think Kathy mentioned earlier, the heritage education tours, we used yeah. to take 2,000 fourth graders around to a mission in one other historic site like Casa Navarro or Spanish Governor's Palace each year. Well, with COVID, we couldn't do that, but it gave us an opportunity, actually. We've done three and are doing two more virtual tours, which we can now share with every school district. So it's not limited by how many Across we can fit on our buses. Too. Yeah, We want to take it to the whole state. But the, uh, the projection technology, we can see how actual colorful mm -hmm. these uh, missions were painted. Not what you see, you know, was just, uh, they're beautiful in their, you know, monochromatic fashion, but to see them painted, uh, that's amazing. Well, it, it, it is, and I think it surprises people, you know, to imagine like 300 years ago, how like awe-inspiring that would have been to come, to come and see the missions painted in that way. and. You know, one of the other things that is going to happen this year that we're really excited about is a partnership with students at SAISD. We worked with art teachers to submit um, drawings that are that will be projected on the facade of the mission. And so, of course, the the main event, the 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 star of the show, is what the um, the facades look like historically. But then, as the evening goes on, there's an opportunity to sort of um, see other images and so it'll be very exciting for the students to see their their artwork up on the facade of, of a World Heritage Mission. A comment uh, from Elaine V. Uh, Vince and Kathy please share how everyone is invited to join the Conservation Society of SA. See that's one of our wonderful volunteers. Yes <laughs> it is. Go to www.saconservation.org and join. Another comment uh, from Mari. Love hearing the stories. My mom went to school at the old Ursuline. We're so happy the Conservation Society stepped in. So this brings up the human connection. You know, it's something I really kind of focus in on. Uh, the buildings are great. I love the buildings, but uh, people use these buildings. This influences them. The built environment uh, in influences us in any number of ways. Um, so. And, and Lewis, you write about that quite a bit in, in your research and in your books. You talk about how the, the plazas of San Antonio were so important. Uh, you know, the Chili Queens, they're, they're long gone, but they're still remembered today. They're part of San Antonio's fabric. They're part of our, our DNA. Uh, and But some people, uh, are, are we saving the history of La Hint, the, Hint, the people, you know? Is that, is that happening? I think it is. I think it is, and I, <clears throat> uh, Night Note San Antonio was so popular to everybody, they go down and have a, have a good time. Thank but you. if they stop to think about the, uh, the words themselves, the name, Night in Old San Antonio, that does reflect right back to the, the good times that everybody had in, uh, in San Antonio in the past, and which are obviously uh, still remembered and cherished and continued. And it will be April 5 through 8 this coming year. All right, so let's talk about NIOSA, NIOSA, however you want to do it with it. But um, with COVID, uh, we haven't had a full NIOSA. And will we ever get back to, you know, crowding all those people into La Villita? It was such a big part of, you know, the experience. But, you know, it was a big fundraiser for Conservation yes. Society. And to do all of this work, not just to, uh, you know, show up at meetings, but you give grants to help people to preserve uh, buildings and, yes. and do things. What's that future look like? I, I hope it looks bright. Um, we've got some construction problems going on right now to have a full full NEOSA, but that's gonna all be taken care of, I'm sure, because we'll work together to make that happen. And um, l this past year, it was later because of COVID. We followed all the protocols and we'll continue to do that. And we didn't have quite as many people this year, but that's understandable. We still had a good crowd, pretty good crowd. But those are the funds. Everybody's a volunteer, number one. Please volunteer <laughs> for next year. And, and um, show our heritage and um, keep it alive. But it was also a, a great education opportunity uh, when you get people to go to an event like this and participate, then they're more likely to uh, join you when it comes time to um, supporting a, a major preservation effort Correct. push. And it's all different kinds of food, and it's wonderful. The food's, yeah, the good. food's great, <laughs> and the friends are great. The old yes. high school buddies are there. Yes, yes. So here's another question uh, from a, a viewer. 
and it's from Ruby. Uh, less than 20 years ago, La Gloria on the west side was demolished. The space held cultural significance to the Mexican-American community. How will blunders like this not happen again? Um, so La Gloria was a restaurant, it was a dance facility, it was part of the, well, San Antonio's west side culture. Uh, people hated to see it go. And what, they just turned it into like a, like a convenience store or something like that, uh, it was a big loss. Yeah, and you know, part of the challenge has been that if you do look historically, we've been around 97 years, but going back 20 years is really when people started to pay more attention to forgotten parts of the city. Or like a little malt house is another example. The malt yeah. house was another example. Laramas. We've successfully saved Lermas, and, and we were uh, involved with that, but of course Esperanza took the lead. Um, I think there's an understanding today that you know we've really got to involve the community. And, and San Antonio, the other thing I would say about San Antonio compared to other towns is you have grassroots preservation organizations more than you do in some other cities. And they're specifically focused on the west side, which you know, has lost significant landmarks like La Gloria, like the Mall House, uh, many others. And so they're, they're, we're going to try to make sure it doesn't happen again. But we have uh, like the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center, mm -hmm. which is uh, preserving that beautiful theater and some of the buildings around it and also the culture in that area. And um, do you all work together? How, do, how does that work, Kathy? Yes, we do all work together. And Vince mentioned the Esperanza and Peace, Peace and Justice Center. We work with them. And um, I have a personal interest because they have um, Center Festival still, I believe, there. Uh, um, that whole area is going to become more important in the future, I think, with UTSA expansion. We don't know how far they're going to go or what they're going to do. So. so that brings up the gentrification issue. <laughs> well, and if, yeah. if I may add, I, I think it, that question underscores the importance of um, community involvement and because you know sometimes there are like la gloria sound i that was before my time but you know it sounds like it was a wonderful place and it's a very sad loss um but you know sometimes there's significance that isn't visible to the naked eye it's more cultural significance it's historical significance and um and the best way to help protect those sites for people that are listening or who are interested is to um to let us know about them and you know, like at OHP, we have um, we have an online um, like crowdsourcing opportunity um, called the Discovery Map, where you can submit your own stories and photos, and and so, and we really encourage people to do that because sometimes there may be a place that we we all just don't even know about yet, and um, and so there is a, a really important opportunity for people to get involved. We also have a. Um, kind of local marker program called There's a Story Here and another called History Here. And it's just, it's a way to really help people think about um, maybe history with a small h, like their family histories and their, you know, things that have been important culturally to them growing up in San Antonio or relocating here or, or um, you know, their grandparents' stories. Like those are the kinds of things we also want to make sure that we're capturing because those then tie back to places that we also want to make, make sure we're trying to preserve. So, um, and but pe family history, you know, stories that were swapped over in Domino's table or cooking in, in the kitchen and the special events. And then maybe some people have some relics or some pictures of some newspaper articles that have been handed down. And people say, I, I want to make sure this gets into the right hands. Is there a repository for preserving this history in San Antonio? maybe you know scanning it or something how do, how do we do that i mean i think there's multiple answers to that question i mean the conservation society does have an an excellent library and librarian who's a, a great resource um we also kind of you know work with people on some of those types of things there's uh the the public library also has a great um repository so like sarah gould she's sort of mexican-american sarah, sarah is a great resource for sure and I think, you know, I, in, on some level it depends on what it is, of course, but, uh, you know, I, I really want to underscore the, the, the option that we're trying to encourage people to take advantage of that is the, you know, kind of there's a story here um, program or history here because um, that's how we can tell the stories that maybe are, are the underrepresented stories. Um, Sarah Gould, you mentioned, uses a, a, a her, one of her examples is she actually um, worked on an application to get a marker, like a state level marker um, related to the floods 
and um, and it wasn't approved. And it's like, you know, for whatever reason, I don't, I don't I, I, we don't need to get into that, but it's like, we really wanted there to be an, oppor an option for San Antonians. And so that's why we developed this, um, the History Here um, marker program and that there's a Story Here program so that we can capture those stories and it doesn't have to be kind of um, intimidating or uh, w the, we can sort of try to eliminate some of the barriers. Right, so, and really quickly now, because we're running out of time, the question of gentrification, we're having some of our legacy neighborhoods, there's some uh, economic success, and that is going to be turbulent in some areas. And how was, what kind of role does the Conservation Society play in that? Well, certainly through the neighborhood associations, we get alerted. The, the bottom line is people have to get involved. And, and if it's in your neighborhood, you need to pay attention. You can't just get up and go to work every day and think that everything's going to be okay. It takes there's a little corner store, been there for 100 years or more, and now it's going to get knocked down. They would, they would notify their neighborhood association and the Conservation Society and the Office of Historic Preservation. And we have created, uh, well, OHP created uh, through these Living Heritage Symposiums, which the society was involved in, in supporting, a legacy business program that's really mm -hmm. looking at how do you preserve things that maybe aren't a building but an institution in the community. So we have new techniques. I mentioned San Francisco. They're the, they're the ones who started legacy business, and I think we're the only other city that has it right now. So, so there are new tools that have been developed, you know, here and, and through... Uh, conferences. I, I want to give a quick plug. We have on the 24th of this month uh, our grants for both educational grants and for building grants. Uh, we're gonna, we have $100,000 of building grants to give out. One of the wonderful things about NEOS is it helps as we put that money back into the community. And uh, those can be found on our website as well. And Lewis Fisher, I uh, want to ask you about, so this UTSA downtown, they're, they're taking this old hotel that's right across the street from Texas Public Radio. Mm -hmm. They're turning that into housing. There's a little candy corner part. There, that's where the old Henry house had been relocated there. Mm -hmm. There's another old building next to it. I hear that was like the original headquarters for the Texas Army or something. Um, the uh, De La Garza house. Yeah, yeah. De La Garza house. What's, mm -hmm. So that's important history. It's, I mean, people don't realize they may walk past that thing every day and not sure. know. How do we, and so what, what's, what, what do we know is going to happen then? They're going to save the De La Garza house on, in, in its location. They're going to move the O'Henry house again, which will, I think will be its fourth move. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're not sure where yet, but, uh, it, you know, that we have seen some buildings move to, in order to save them. You probably see it more here than in other then places. And De La Garza house will be moved? No, it'll be kept in place. The O'Henry house will yeah, be moved. Yeah, I just want to make sure. Yeah. And how is that going to work? It's been moved before. I know, but the, the De La Garza house is kind of like right in the middle of the footprint. They've of designed around it, basically. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's the, the design has gone through the HDRC approval process and received approvals. So. And then the Navarro house is, is in the pocket as well, which is next to Wackenhut. When they were knocking down Wackenhut, the old jail, were you yes. worried that the, the, yes. the, 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 the demolition ball was going to hit right. the Navarro house? No, that was saved. And we... We owned it, and then the state owns it. So, um, and your moving question, we moved a whole hotel, remember? At Fairmont. <laughs> yes. Right. So, um, so it was at River Center Mall. Yes. And you so said, we need to save this building. Let's move it over here. Right between Saws and River Center. Okay. And um, kind of a late-breaking question, uh, Rosemary C., I've done research at, uh, in, on Institute of Texas Culture. What is the status of the building and of the contents? Well, wow, that's a loaded question. Uh, what do well, we know? It's actually, I'm, I'm on an advisory committee that UTSA has convened to determine that question, both the building and the contents. And it, they're really in early stages right now. So, so the Institute of Texan Culture is one of the last buildings from Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. and, um, and all the contents of it, the city of San Antonio owns the no UTSA, no, UTSA, owns, UTSA it. owns it but the city of San Antonio would love to have that property there's been talk about swaps uh, it's it's a much sought after a uh, piece of land uh, and it's really a it's been an ongoing question for for quite some time yeah and, and what do you want to see happen I would love to see a redevelopment of that site um, if I think if they want to move the 
uh, collections to another site with the main campus and, and redevelop that. We would like to see it preserved. It's, it's an important building. It's a challenging building, brutalist architecture. A lot of people don't like that. You see a lot of science fiction movies. Uh, yeah. like <laughs> Lo it reminds me of Logan's Run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so, Shannon, with the, is it getting uh, more challenging with all of this new activity in San Antonio, the growth and development, trying to satisfy, like you mentioned, politics is a big part of it. Um, how do you, how does that balance going to work out? Yeah, you know, I, I think, I think our challenges moving forward are, are related to the same, you know, it, it's what the community is facing as a whole. Um, our, our need for affordable housing, we, we did a study um, a couple of years ago called the Opportunity at Risk that looked at um, the way older his, older housing stock is meeting the city's affordable housing needs and how it can continue to do so. And so making sure that we're looking at ways to avoid demolition when possible, to reinvest in, uh, in housing units at a time when they're not endangered, you know, like earlier interventions. Right, because we've seen demolition by neglect. Sure, and, and, that, and that's a, a certain, that's a, definitely a challenge. And, and, and then, you know, the climate adaptation plan is, is another important kind of factor. Like we, we, we've been promoting a deconstruction ordinance as a way to kind of, when properties do come down, we want to capture that material instead of putting it in a landfill able where they're we're then able to use those higher quality historic materials almost like an organ donor concept to to be able to extend the life of of um, ideally affordable housing units in the city and so there's a, there's just a lot of interconnectedness between the issues that are facing the community as a whole and historic preservation Lewis Fisher I want to go to you for, as we go to quick closing comments uh, where do you see uh, you know the San Antonio preserving history and saving it for the next generation. How do we know that we're we're doing this uh, for the what the next generation wants to know? Well, I think if you connect the dots, you'll certainly see a lot of upward uh, movement, upward progress, improvement in the way that uh, um, buildings, the environment, the built environment has been uh, preserved over time. And I think uh, from what uh, we've heard tonight from the folks who are actively involved in in doing that, that. Uh, that I think we have a lot of uh, uh, confidence that in the future uh, we will uh, be enjoying a lot of uh, historic preservation. And, and Vincent, Michael, what are the goals right now moving forward, maybe 5, 10, 20 years out? I think the goal is how do you balance the new development that's coming in, the new people that are coming in, with saving what's most important. And to me, that's a really exciting challenge. It's a design challenge, and it's one I think we can help meet. And the community, what, is, what does the community want? I, I think that's the, the key. To me, preservation is about asking the community what's important and having them help you decide how you bring that into the future. And, the, and what we used to think the community wanted back then, 20 years ago, is very different today. Yes. How so? Well, there's several things. I mean, you look at what are the growth areas for tourism, uh, civil rights trail. You know, preserving the Woolworth Building gives you a site on the civil rights trail. No sites in Texas right now on that trail. It's a great opportunity. Right. And, and real quick, back to Lewis Fisher. We don't save enough of our Wild West history in San Antonio. <laughs> Why is that? Everything is like overshadowed by, um, you know, of independence. But we don't, rec I mean, we've had things happen in the streets of San Antonio that make the OK Corral look like a pea shooter fight. It's, it's curious. People come to San Antonio, conventioners come to San Antonio, they expect to see some of this uh, shoot 'em up past. Uh, we do have the uh, the Briscoe Museum. That has been uh, has been one thing that is dedicated to the to the cowboy and to the uh, to the West. And we could probably use some more of it. And perhaps with the uh, Fanny Porter House, we'll have another uh, element to add. I still remember it was a circus museum. That was a hoot. <laughs> and, and Kathy Rhodes. So, what do you see for the immediate future and long term future for? San Antonio Conservation Society? Well, I think maintaining maintaining our buildings and getting more people involved, community involvement, and um, as you mentioned, our, our image. Uh, I want to preserve our image as the most historic place in Texas and, and the country. Um, it's brought economic development. It's brought people. But we have to marry the new technology that we have with with saving the old. Like Shannon mentioned, the 
the art on the, on the mission. I mean, that's a great example of combining the old with the new technology and getting the kids interested in, in it because they're used to looking at screens and that sort of thing. So that, that marries that. But there's always a challenge. We, some of them we don't know yet, which is kind of the fun of it a little bit to imagine what, what's going to pop up next. So. We have advocates like uh, Everett Fry, yes. who's talking about preserving the African-American history yes. of San Antonio. Uh, and that's got to be a priority. We have to push that to, you know, one of the top things and say, sure. you know, uh, for so long, this community did not have a seat at the table, and now we have to make sure that they're always there. We, we just discussed a cemetery on the north side in Council District 10 with the councilman, and nobody seems to know who owns it or, or anything about it, so we're looking into that. There were names on graves like Friesenheim, so it was obviously a German community. So there's, a, uh, there's something new all the time um, to challenge us and to dig deeper into our roots. And uh, once again, how do people get in contact with, become part of, uh, just shout at you at the Conservation sure, Society? Sure, we're on the web. We're everywhere. www.saconservation.org or 210-224-6163. All right. I want to thank uh, all of our panelists uh, this evening. We had uh, Kathy Rhodes, president of the San Antonio Conservation Society, Vincent Michael, the executive director of the San Antonio Conservation Society, Shannon Shea Miller is the uh, City of San Antonio's Historic Preservation Officer, and Lewis Fisher he is a San Antonio author, historian, publisher, a San Antonio treasure, a reservoir uh, of deep knowledge. I'm David Martin Davies. This has been Great Essay, a series of conversations about what makes San Antonio's culture uh, so fantastic, and this has been made possible due to support from Culligan Water of San Antonio and Frost. Thanks for watching. <laughs>